Hello Clarkston, I'm Rod Rock, Superintendent of Schools, and this is Real Learning, where we showcase the excellent learning and teaching that happen every day in the Clarkston Community Schools. Today I'm joined by Clarkston Junior High School Principal Adam Kern and four Clarkston Junior High School teachers, and I'd like to ask them to introduce themselves to us. Let's start with you, Adam. Good afternoon, Dr. Rock. Uh, my name is Adam Kern. I'm the principal at Clarkston Junior High School, and I've been in Clarkston for 16 years now. Hello, my name is Allie Bro, and I teach eighth grade English at the junior high school. My name is Jonathan Paddock. I am a ninth grade biology teacher and honors conceptual physics teacher. Hi, I'm Jessica Cleland. I teach eighth grade language arts, and this is my eighth year in Clarkston. And I'm Mike Grevy. This is my 16th year teaching in Clarkston, and I teach eighth and ninth grade history. Thank you all very much for being here. I'm really excited to see all of the uh, opportunities that students are having to, to learn and show their learning at Clarkson Junior High School. And Mr. Kern, can you tell us kind of how that got started this year? Yes, well, it's, it's actually been a process that's been going on for quite a few years now. Uh, pretty much as soon as we started with the cultures of thinking and making thinking visible, we've been trying to figure out ways to help students show their learning, um, especially for those students who uh, may not do as well on tests or things like that. How can we allow those students to show what they are learning and to be able to express that and show that and um, be able to for us to know that they are understanding the material and the content. So we've been looking at ways of how can we display this information, how can we get their learning across without necessarily having to do a, a test. Thank you very much. And I know the teachers we have with us today have really asked students to stretch themselves and we've seen some of those examples in the newspaper and, and some things that students have done on Twitter in different places in the community with their activism. So can you uh, take a few minutes to explain some of those opportunities that you've provided for our students? Mike, would you like to start? Sure, I'll start. I, I took my students this year uh, in a different direction. We, we looked in my ninth grade history class at civil rights issues around Metro Detroit and around this area, and specifically uh, uh, civil rights issues that, have, that are current today. Mm -hmm. um, through Oakland Schools, my students were able to work on a project-based learning approach where we took a month of our class period and we worked on learning about the history of Detroit and the problems that exist still today. And the culminating project with that was I took two groups of students, nine students total down to Wayne State University a couple weekends ago for a civil rights convention uh, with different leaders, civic leaders from the area and other people that are, uh, other students that were competing and completing this project from other schools. Wonderful, thank you. Mm -hmm. How about you, Jessica? So this is my second year with uh, something we call the multi-genre project. And so students at the beginning of the year select a topic or an idea that they are passionate about, that they would like to pursue for the year. And over the course of the time, they write uh, several pieces of writing about that topic. Um, within that topic, they do some blogging, they do some inquiry. And that leads us to an activist project that the students self-select that is related back to that topic or idea. And so kids have topics such as um, be the change you want to see. Mm -hmm. I've got kids who have a topic as simple as running. And from those topics came some really important activist work. Um, so one of those projects was a girl started a Detroit tutoring mm -hmm. um, program. Mm -hmm. And so she has been going down to the Detroit Achievement Academy to tutor young kids. I had a chance to go along with them. And it was just an amazing thing to see, to see the culmination of all her work that she had planned all year long, making the phone calls, um, going to places to pitch her ideas, and winning, uh, being awarded money to mm -hmm. support that. It was just incredible to see that, you know, that culminating moment when I got to see her there and doing her work. Another girl I had, um, she did a shoe drive, and it was great to see because there's a lot of problems that come up throughout the activist work. They'll have a big fat nose told to them. Um, they have a lot of things going on in terms of emailing people, communicating through letters, and so there's a lot of, um, I guess, stepping stones along the way, but the kids really learn how to persevere, and they do everything. I, I won't help them with it. I, they say, I need to email this person. I'm like, okay, well, you get on that. <laughs> Start emailing. And so uh, the shoe drive was very successful too. One of her bumps in the road was she was unable to ship the product because it was going to cost too much money. And I had suggested that at the beginning. I'm like, you got to be careful because you know to ship to another country, I knew it was going to be a lot of money. So she um, persevered and she found a way around that and contacted the organization that she wanted to donate to. And they led her to a, a store at Somerset Mall who actually takes the shoes and will ship them for free for you. So her and her family went down over the weekend and delivered all 64 pair of shoes that she collected. Wow. So she wrote about that in a reflection letter and just 
uh, both of those girls in the reflection letter mentioned how it wasn't just a grade for them, that this was something that they really felt passionate about and that both of them would like to continue this in the future. Excellent. So lots of connections beyond just the classroom projects. For sure. How about you, John? Uh, this year I tried a uh, new project uh, that I called Free Space with my honors conceptual physics class. And uh, Free Space was an experiment to try to find out what would kids learn if they could learn anything they want and if there was no grade rewarded for it. And uh, what I saw was amazing. Every week my kids got one day a week to work on their Free Space project and we did that on Fridays. And uh, it, it was an exercise in interest-led learning. And the kids picked something that they were really passionate about. They picked something that was interesting to them. And they did it just because the act of learning is a lot of fun. And, uh, and what I saw every week, week in, week out, all the way up to the end of the year was, uh, was truly amazing. It was really inspiring to see just how different kids are and how, uh, how they enjoy learning things. And, uh, and they each have their own passion. And it was really cool to be able to see that and how that played out. Thank you. How about you, Allie? Um, well, during our argument writing unit this semester, we focused on protest and activism, and we kind of um, zoomed in on the groups of people that we wanted to um, fight for and give a voice to. And so my students were able to choose any topic that they wanted. And um, they were very excited about this because they were able to voice a lot of concerns that they have um, within our school and then within the Clarkson community and, and also with, with our world as well. And some of the examples from my classes, we were very fortunate to pair with the Clarkston newspaper and some of their protest activism articles were published in the newspaper. Um, one was about how we should switch over to standards-based grading. Another one um, was about saving the ecosystem. Uh, another one was how we need to fight to have uh, mental awareness within our schools mm -hmm. and things like that. So it's just issues that are very um, important to them and very real in their lives right now. And then they also created a form of protest or activism artwork to pair with the argument that they were making in their articles. And they were able to do that in a song or a poem or a painting or a rap or whatever it was that they wanted to do and create and put that out there in the world for people to read and to listen to. That's fascinating. So um, I'm hearing each of you talk about the personal connections that students have made with their learning and what, what kinds of things have you learned about students or learning in general through this process? Uh, oh, go ahead. I was going to say that I, I noticed most significantly, I think, that a lot of the kids who did really, really well with this project were not the A students. Uh, they weren't the ones that were the book smart kids that were always knew exactly what they needed to do to get the A. It was a lot of the kids who have that, uh, that interest in the project that we were doing and they have the interest in school, but maybe sitting down and doing work out of a textbook and answering questions and reading through that way is not their way of learning. Uh, and these kids really shined. A lot of them really shined in the, uh, and they did a great job with making connections to what mm -hmm. they found interesting and then relating it back to what they're supposed to be learning. So that obviously helps our students develop their own voices and to feel powerful. Absolutely, Ab absolutely. What other kinds of things have you learned? Um, I definitely saw during this unit and in my classroom that students are very, very eager to voice um, what they feel is right and what they feel is wrong in our world and in our community. And once you give them that space and that outlet to voice those types of concerns and issues and social topics, they really take whatever they care about and run with it and they have so much freedom to be able to do that and I think um, again it's all about creating that space in which they feel comfortable and confident to to talk about what is truly important to them and then to then have the community come back and read what they're saying and know that their voice matters and can make a difference even though they might be 13 or 14 years old. So having that authentic audience of, and I imagine your students have gotten some feedback, Allie, from the newspapers, things that they've posted. It's been really important to them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, community members have come up to me and said they were very impressed that it was from an eighth grade level. And I mm -hmm. said, yeah, this is what you know, our kids can do and say. So. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you. What kinds of uh, or what types of roles have students played in making the, these learning opportunities happen? I, uh, I would say for me, you know, the roles that the students play is 
you know, so often we talk about education reform and we talk a lot about, you know, the top down approach. Mm -hmm. and, and so for me, it was we need to understand that the students are the most important constituent in the whole school system. And so for them, they were the ones that drove it. They were the ones, you know, I told them at the beginning, it will either work or it won't. And, um, and, and they were the ones that really drove it. They wanted to see it succeed. Mm -hmm. They wanted to see more opportunities like this where they could pursue things that are interesting to them. They wanted an opportunity to show the world that, you know, don't underestimate a ninth grader because they can do some amazing things. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so for me, they were the ones that really drove the whole project. Okay. Is that similar for you, Jessica? Because Yeah, I would agree with John. I think it's all about the empowerment piece, um, giving kids that power to take charge of their own learning. Uh, it's, it's a different scenario when you are not the one standing up there giving them all the information mm -hmm. and telling them what move to make next. I feel like the, the kids really learned that when they had the power to do it themselves, they actually work so much harder. That's what mm -hmm. I learned about them. That they're more motivated, they're more um, apt to follow through on things that they want to do because it's something that's important to them. They have those real emotional connections to it. So where do you see this going in the future? Well, I would say that I think that the combination of what we're doing already in the classroom and project-based learning, I think could be a very powerful way to, to teach students. Uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to discount the value of them learning information in the mm -hmm. traditional sense in which we've done, but at the same time, this, the projects that we've created and the, and the work that I see them do out of this just deepens their understanding of the thing so much more and gives them such ownership of it. I think it's a, a much better way to enhance what they are learning okay. and make sure that they are interested in their own education. Thank you. And, and building on that, why do you think that this is important in, in the 21st century? I know that become kind of a cliche, but in terms of the skills and the dispositions our students need to really be able to pursue their passions and contribute to our world in a positive way, what kinds of skills and dispositions do you think are most important for our kids? I think through these kind of um, project-based learning activities or opportunities, we're giving kids the chance to be local and global citizens mm -hmm. and that's something that we definitely need to um, create in them and create that drive and that ambition. I feel like that when they do these things they're set on that path so much earlier. They don't have to wait to, an, to be an adult to change the world. Mm -hmm. They can change it now and they can follow their passions now and they can follow what they want to do and how they want to change the world and I think that along with all the decisions they have to make during these projects is definitely setting them up for the future. Um, they're making phone calls, they're making emails, they're asking questions, mm -hmm. they're doing their own inquiry, and that in itself is so powerful in terms of their future. And if I could add on that, I would say, you know, some of those soft skills that we talk about, some of that tenacity, the ability to look at a problem and, you know, figure out what are all the different steps that have to happen to solve that problem. Um, and one of the things that I talk a lot with my kids about is constructive failure. You know, um, if talking about you know the 21st century mm -hmm. or the job market you know that that ability to not necessarily take no for an answer the first time or to fail at something 10 times before you finally figure out how to reverse engineer it and get it the 11th time you know those kind of things are, are the things that are going to set our students apart mm -hmm. um, those those abilities and I was doing some reading this morning in a Scott Barry Kaufman book called Wired to Create and he's he's saying that uh, that's exactly what our students need because so often they get direct instruction and teachers tell them what they need to learn and that doesn't really give them the opportunity to think creatively or even to have their creative thinking honored when there's only one right answer. So even the, just our students' thought process, processes in terms of what it means to be creative, I think when they have these kind of opportunities they can see it for themselves and they really feel empowered. So I'm really grateful for you doing this. So, Mr. Kern, I always appreciate your leadership at the junior high and the way you share leadership and the ways that you're trying to get kids to think and show what they learn, show what they know. Um, I know you had your student sh learning showcase this year. How do you see this idea maybe continuing to grow? I think it's, it's something that we will continue to do. Um, this first year was a success in my eyes, and I think if you talk to the other four people here with me that they would agree. Um, we designed this this year um, after watching the documentary Most Likely to Succeed, a couple of our students helped bring that into our school to see some of the things that happen in different schools. And one of those things was a learning showcase. And what we wanted to really truly do is share the learning of all of our students 
So many times we always recognize those students with the really high grades, the, a, or the LAs or the, the really high achieving students yet. There's so much great learning that's going on with every single one of our students in our school. And um, they oftentimes don't have that outlet to share that. So the learning showcase was designed to help um, all of our students show to their parents, their family, what it is the learning that they have done this year. Um, this year we just did restrict it to uh, the families, but I think moving forward we'd like to share that with the community um, and other people um, in this area so that they can see what all of our students are doing and see the great things that each individual student in our schools do because there are some really great things that are occurring and that um, it's pretty amazing if you really take a look at the things that they're creating, the learning that is going on, the individualized learning that is happening for these students is pretty amazing and the, and the projects that each one of these guys have talked about today are so impressive um, from being in the Clarkson News as an eighth grader to working with kids in Vietnam to working on rights projects or developing their own musical instruments and things like that in Mr. Paddock's class. There's just amazing things going on so we want to continue with those things and, and allow those students to showcase that and display that learning for everyone who uh, wants to come see the great things that are going on in Clarkston. And this isn't like what I'm thinking about when I was in middle school when we had science fairs where I would get a piece of cardboard and look in the dictionary and find out about turtles and draw some pictures. It's much, much deeper than that what our kids are doing. So we might have people who have a certain perception of project-based learning and things and our students are really pushing us beyond and it's not cookie cutter things that they're, they're really independent thinkers. So is there anything else that anybody would like to add? I would just like to say that, I mean, <laughs> it, this year when we started the Learning Showcase, I rolled it out to teachers as not much information, just saying go for it. Show what the students know, help them display that information. And I think as we continue on that, it's going to become more natural. I think at times maybe it was a little bit uh, forced in certain areas of um, let's do this project so we have something to show. But I think as time goes on, it's going to become more natural. And I think um, there's a few teachers who had that, these guys here, a couple other teachers back in the building who really um, showed that and just let the learning go. And I think as more of that happens, we're going to start seeing greater projects, collaboration across departments. I think the more that this grows, the more the students are going to see the connections from one subject matter to another, and I think it's just going to continue to get bigger and bigger and stronger and stronger as we move forward. I'd like to add one more thing. Just, I would uh, say just don't let fear get in the way, because there's been so many times I wanted to start something new, but fear would start to hold me back, but then I would, I would work through that. Like the first time I did digital portfolios with the kids, I had no idea what I was doing. But I let the kids help me, I let the kids teach me. And just to trust the kids, a lot of times that we're not willing to give that trust to the kids. And once you do, and once I have done that, amazing things have happened. So just getting past that fear, take the risk, let the kids lead the way. Mm -hmm. it's, I think that's the most powerful thing I've learned. Thank you. And if I could add, I, I think, you know, what we need to do is we're, we're showing that school is so much more than just a number on a piece of paper. And you know the, the thing that happens with parent-teacher conferences is you do all these wonderful things in your classroom and you do all these awesome projects and then a parent sits down at your table and they have a couple minutes to basically get a number snapshot of how their student is doing. And so if, you know, if we're gonna embrace this idea that school is so much more than just that number on the paper, we need to give students the opportunity to show the world these are all the awesome things that we're doing, not just I have an 87.5 in the mm -hmm. class. And I was really impressed when I came over because you show the breadth of our students. So you might walk into a science or history class and see their project and then you could listen to them play an instrument and then you could walk into the art room and see things that they're creating. So we know our students are very diverse in what they contribute and how they think. So it's wonderful to be able to see that. So uh, I'm really grateful to each of you for taking the time to be here on the show today and for our community to get to know better what, what's happening in our schools. And we know for sure that if we want our students to be creative and innovative thinkers, then we need our teachers to do the, to do the same kinds of things and to offer students those opportunities. And I'm really pleased and, and I'm thankful that our Clarkson Junior High teachers and our teachers across the district are creative and innovative in their practices. Thank you for tuning in.